Thank you for being with us today for this very special JPS webcast. I've been looking forward to this opportunity to have a discussion with this very special individual and a good friend. We hope that you enjoy this discussion as much as Iggy Brigado and I enjoy having this opportunity to provide it to you. Please send us your questions. We will answer them at the end of the program. We're honored to have Don Scott with us today. Don and two other engineers founded JPS in 1988, making him the S in JPS. Prior to becoming an entrepreneur, he was employed in engineering design and leadership positions at Litton Landis, Sun Air Electronics, and ITT McKay. Don has held multiple clearances and traveled to hotspots. He has a BSEE from Drexel University where he played college football. In his 15 years of playing high school, college, and semi-pro football, he sustained at least three concussions that he knows of and believes that explains his quirky personality. Don has an MBA from Nova Southeastern University. He is the holder of several patents. He enjoys playing the bagpipes, researching genealogy, studying American history, and traveling internationally. He believes God has given him many blessings, more than he ever thought possible as a young man. Growing up, Don and his family did not have indoor plumbing, had an outside well for water, and heated by a single stove until he was 20 years old. He attributes wanting to do right in this world to his humble roots and lots of family love. Don, it's very good to see you and have this opportunity to have this discussion with you. You and I have known each other for many years personally. I think of you as an American Renaissance man. You are the epitome of American success from humble beginnings to success on many levels. Thank you again for being with us today, Don. Don, why did you start JPS Communications? What was the catalyst for doing that? Thanks for the intro. It was a very kind one, Carol. I will go back into the mid 80s to talk about starting JPS. Tom Jacks, Peter Flaster, started with a P-F-L-A-S-T-E-R-E-R. -E -E That's the P and I started the business in 88, but we worked together first at Sun Air Electronics where Tom and I were employed. Peter was a consultant we hired to design synthesizers. And we got back together again in the mid eighties in Raleigh at ITT McKay. That was part of the telecom division here in Raleigh. ITT, of course, sold all that and became Alcatel in uh, 87. And Alcatel didn't want an HF radio paramilitary manufacturer. They wanted the telecom business. And so they resold ITT McKay to private investors and it became a small business, Mackey Communications Inc. The new owners decided they didn't want to spend R&D money, they rather harvest the revenue. And so Tom and Peter and I were stuck not doing much interesting design work. We then sat down and created a business plan to design peripherals for HF radio based on the, the knowledge that ITT McKay and now Mackey Communications didn't have some of these things, took it to the leadership, the new owners, and said, here, let us design these things. They said, no, we really aren't interested. And so Tom, Peter, and I decided we'd go off and write proposals nights and weekends to see if we could land something on our own, and if so, then start our own business. So we incorporated JPS Communications in July of 1988, a C-Corp, while we're writing proposals nights and weekends. We landed one in October of 88. It was as a sub to a prom to a, an intelligence organization. We had to design video vogads and audio vogads for them. VOGAD meaning voice operated gain adjusting device. And we went, decided that uh, we couldn't work and do that at the same time. So we rented a storefront, basically resigned and went to work. We put 
each uh, put a thousand dollars into the pool and we rented the storefront from that plus bought a copier and a fax machine of course that was the catalyst being bored with having no r d and deciding we needed to design some things to make our lives worthwhile who were your first customers done what what markets were they in primarily at that time well the business plan called for designing peripherals for hf radio and as you know hf radio uses the ionosphere the bounce signals it's very noisy what was coming into the world at the time that had big interest for us was a family of processors called digital signal processors and we realized we could do things with them that it would have taken a room full of analog equipment to do. And so peripherals for HF radio in the business plan started out with the first product, an RTU 200. That's a radio telephone interface unit, a phone patch. And of course, with a DSP hybrid, you can achieve a dynamic nulling and balancing of 40 db across the audio spectrum so that was the first product and we decided since we were trying to do it for Mackey communications we could also sell it to harris rf communications rockwell collins datron rooted Schwartz, and of course the second product also based on digital signal processing was noise reduction for HF audio. Uh, you know anything about HF audio, it has ignition noise, it has power line noise, <clears throat> it has static, it has uh, it, um, all kinds of interference. And with DSP, we knew we could characterize human speech using something that engineers know about called fast Fourier transformations to identify human speech in any language by either gender of speaker and remove the noise from the speech and so the second product in the business plan was noise reduction again this was all for hf radio at the time uh, from there we went into uh, other areas including since the HF radio manufacturers were buying these and reselling them in their systems, we began to get inquiries from the government, the US government, and that leads us uh, into a world that I think Carol's interested in, and that is uh, uh, what kind of selling, how did we sell? Am I right, Carol? That's exactly right. That's that's always a, a, a big part of the, any of the plans of a new company is, is what the sales model is going to look like, whether you have direct salespeople or or independent manufacturers rep and do you use distribution? So what what uh, what type of sales model did you select on at that time? Well, I, I was here. Uh, my two partners looked at me and they said, look, you got the personality. I said, what do you mean by that? They said, well, you're the one that can go out there and talk to folks. And I said, well, okay, what does that mean? They said, well, you're sales. You're VP of sales and marketing. And we said, well, okay, uh, if I'm that, then who's president? And we looked at Peter, and of course, Peter had his own business in Tennessee, which failed. And we decided to make him president because he knew from that experience, how not to fail the second time, which left Tom then to be VP of engineering. At any rate, I'm selling and I rapidly realized I can't sell to all the HF manufacturers and all the federal government, which by then was starting to spill into the military without some help. And by then, of course, we had hired people like Mike Cox and Doug Hall and John Van but they're all technical people and they're cranking out more products like an MTX 1616 switch matrix that customers wanted. They're cranking out radio retransmission units that customers wanted. 
And I said, well, how do I do this? And some of my customers said, well, there's this entity in the market called a rep. And I said, well, okay, what's a rep? And they said, well, that's somebody that sells your product and uh, they make a commission on every sale. And that's a good thing because they are a force enhancer. And so I got some reps initially in the federal government. And of course, they were largely in the Washington, D.C. area. But uh, as we grew, then the market began to expand more and more across the country as these products gained notoriety and we were then being pulled into the land mobile radio market the market for amateur radio products we were now being sought by systems integrators and prime contractors and public safety and there was some things that I think Carol's going to get into when we go through this interview, but I said, well, how do I do that? How do I enter this land mobile radio market? And I thought of my reps in Washington and went to an IWCE, our first one, because people were telling us, you need to do that. Well, here comes Carol and... Uh, some others and and uh, they talked to us about you uh, would you like us to rep you and, and we said well sure and so we got reps like dh marketing and power sales carl mathis and we then realized through them that there are a lot of dealers out there selling in the land mobile radio and so they repped us to the dealers and Besides that, of course, we were going directly to users that had now expanded from HF radio manufacturers and OEMs to VHF, UHF, to uh, the radios that are common in public safety. Now, of course, the reps are a fourth multiplier. What we always said was if we can be perhaps their third largest revenue driver, that we're going to get more than or share their time and that'll amplify what i can do uh, then of course we had hired roger williams and lee martin who handled the federal government and the military respectively but the reps are the ones that carried us into the world where things like voters that we never heard of and interoperability evolved All right yeah that's uh those were good times. Those and the good times are, are back again. We appreciate it. Don, how and why did you create the ACU one thousand? What what brought that about at that time? Several things actually. The and as we said, as you said when we got into this, it's been a blessing. This has been the most wonderful road to travel. And we've traveled it together. And the ACU 1000 is part of that story. We had, of course, manufactured retransmission units, radio telephone interface units, switch matrix units, noise reduction units, and our customers in the systems integration world and the prime contractor world were ranking and stacking those and controlling them from computers. And about that time, we had Columbine High School, which you all remember, of two nutcases went in and killed a bunch of students at Columbine. And we began to get pressure from certain entities. Well, if you can rack and stack this stuff, why can't you put it into one box? Then we have the bombing of the Murrah building in Oklahoma City and the pressure to do that got stronger. And so we decided, okay, we're gonna take another risk. Risk is part of being an entrepreneur and developing products is listening to the market, isn't it? If the market's asking you for something, then probably if you develop it, you'll sell it. Besides that, the federal government was saying it's only a matter of time until we get hit by a mass casualty incident. And they gave us a contract after we developed the ACU 1000 through DOJ, 
But in developing the ACU-1000, all we did was make modules out of the radio interfaces and the telephone interfaces and put noise reduction in it and added the switch matrix and give it a CPU. And lo and behold, we had a 3U interoperability gateway, which had demand and started selling. Now, the greatest handicap to selling it wasn't the technical solution, it was the politics interoperability. And that being that agencies don't naturally want to act like they're talking on a neighboring agency's frequency, but that's exactly what they needed when you get a Columbine high school and you have 20 agencies responding, then they gotta talk to each other. And so the first bridge or gateway was born that in that fashion. You know, at the, the ACU 1000 wasn't the lightest piece of equipment in land mobile radio at the time. I think you've carried those things millions of miles, did you not? A long yeah. way since. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when we reacquired the assets, I discovered we had over 9,000 of them in the field. <laughs> a lot of them. You know, there was so much success with the ACU 1000. And, and then um, along comes another product. I, I'm curious as to, as to how and what the thought process was for creating uh, the SNV 12 signal noise voter. That was kind of off track, wasn't it? Out of the box? I'm sorry, what was that last statement? It said that, was, that was kind of off track, wasn't it? That it, it was. didn't fit the other products. It was, but in business, you can't stay in in one market you can't stay with one product line and our philosophy by then through the business plan and become have multiple product lines once again though the market was talking to us and we listened and of course we made a colossal mistake in the process of developing the snv 12 receiver comparator signal to noise voter which I'll give you kind of the humorous side of, but customers were coming to us once again and saying, look, we see you're, uh, you're able to reliably identify speech in noise. Why can't you measure that speech? And by the way, we see you're able to remove noise from speech. Why can't you measure the noise and in the process give us something we haven't had something new in land mobile radio every technology in the voter world is old technology this would be new could you not do a signal to noise voter that measures speech and noise and calculates snr we said well okay mm, that makes sense uh, tell us what you need and they said well we need something we can try and so we took a a box 19 inches wide and 19 inches deep and put some noise reduction modules in it and equipped it with signal to noise measurement and made the first voter. Of course, it was packaged wrong. We were hasty taking it to market. Though it proved the pack and the customer said, look, and Carol and other reps are saying the same thing. The dealers are saying the same thing. Hey, this is the wrong package, but it proves the point. Now we need you to package it so it looks like an ACU. And by the way, we're going to help you because we're going to tell you what it needs to do. And so <laughs> the SNV-12 was born through that process. And as you very well know out there as a listener, nothing stays the same and every application every use case has a growth process where you like something to do more than it currently does and we've learned through this process which carol has pointed out that if you listen to the market your product lines are going to grow the voter of course is a big piece of our revenue even today and when i was negotiating to reacquire the assets my question was can it carry us along with the acu until we come out with new product no it's been very successful it's 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 hugely successful as you know and it uh is so as, as you brought that up about the assets so t tell us about uh selling jps communications and 
and the and the, your thoughts and and your reasoning for doing that at the time, Don, if you don't mind. Oh, that's a, for me. I wasn't ready to sell, but Tom and Peter were, and the sequence of events were what led up to 9-11. We had come out with the ACU. DOJ had given us a multi-million dollar contract to package that in transportable cases in something we called the PRP-1000. And they were saying it's not if, it's when we get hit, as I said before. So they were through the intelligence mechanism in this country telling us where to ship these units. And of course, we were shipping them and installing them, and there was one in Alexandria, Virginia. And we had shipped 10 to New York City, and we had surveyed the World Trade Center for deployment. And as you know, 9-11 happened, Pentagon got hit. That interoperability worked. The ones that were in New York didn't because they hadn't been deployed yet. But my partners and I realized something was going to come out of this, this uh, post 9-11 world. Eventually it did, and it was called DHS. And we said, we've been funding R&D. We can't really fund it fast enough or big enough to take advantage of what we think is coming, a la DHS. And so they said, I think we should sell. And being a three on the board, I got outvoted. And so I got to take the business plan to Motorola and Harris and Raytheon and Maycom and of course, people begin to talk to us, begin to do their due diligence. And Macon, which is now Harris, and Raytheon were bidding and got down to where Macom dropped out because they had some internal problems. Then you have Raytheon doing the deal. And the next thing we know, we are owned by a large DOD firm that had a, an intention and a successful one of going into Homeland Security with some of their technology, including us as the centerpiece, let's say. Yeah, I, they at that time, it must have been a, uh, a real life-changing experience for you. Uh, you know, tell us a little bit, Don, if you don't mind, about your position with the company that bought you after you sold it. And what was it like going from a small business to a to a very large DOD company at that time? My position, of course, at JPS had been VP of sales and marketing. That's a very broad term. I had not been able to do all the facets of that well because of growth but as we're acquired benefits suddenly got much much better and opportunity got much much better because now we're part of a bigger organization moving into homeland security my position then morphed within the greater company the DOD firm into business development. That's what they call it. And so I was a VP of BD because they put their own leadership in position here in Raleigh. And that was fun. That was a lot of fun because for me, uh, there were two things I wanted to do and I got to do them both. When you think about selling a company, there's a wonderful experience the day of closing with your account, your bank account, but there's also a follow on in what is called earn out for a number of years in which your ownership has residual value. And I wanted to make mine worth something year one, year two, and so forth. So I had carte blanche and I could travel to all the divisions of this big DOD firm. And my goal was A, to introduce the ACU so they can bed it into their prom beds and B, 
take some of their technology and downscope it so I could then carry it into public safety and LMR. So I got to go places. In the process, I got to write proposals and help to go after some really big items. As you know, companies like that exist on $50, $100 million contracts. Yeah, you know, it. Um, then then there, there came the time that you did decide to retire and uh, that knowing you as long as I've known you and and so many others that are at JPS and the culture that's there there's there seems to be one thing in common everyone runs a thousand miles an hour and no one no one likes to sit very still very long so can you talk to us about your retirement and how how that uh, how you adapted to retirement at that time yes I can Retirement, of course, was something that by obligation in my contract with the larger parent company, I didn't have the option of doing initially because I had a five-year contract with various incentives and a non-compete. And I stayed an extra year because they convinced me to do that. And so I was there six years and watched the evolution, watched a lot of good things happen, and got to that place where I said, now I can finally do the things I never had time to do before, and I retired. And of course, I stayed retired then for seven years, as y'all probably know, and filled my days up with the things I never got to do before. That was a grand time. My wife and I traveled. I didn't sleep in my own bed, but about three nights in the first nine <laughs> days of retirement because we were all over the place and we traveled. And I got to do things that I love to do. And so uh, I adapted, and that's because I have plenty of hobbies. And uh, I've always had those interests. If I had it to do over and I could have made money, I'd have gone different directions, perhaps. I might have been a history teacher. Yep. So that's that's wonderful that you had those years to, to do those several things. And, and you do have some very interesting hobbies. I, I think that's uh, the statement I made earlier that uh, leads me to think of you as a renaissance man. And I, I truly believe that. So. So what was what was it like when you decided you wanted to buy back JPS Communications, the company that you had founded from the company that you sold it to? There were various contributing factors to the opportunity to reacquire it. First, as I was retired, I maintained connections with folks in the market and I would periodically get calls about why aren't, isn't your company servicing this need anymore? Obviously there were needs in the market that were going unmet and I could see them. I couldn't do anything about it, but I knew they were there. There are certain parts of this business that are always gonna have a need. And so knowing that and watching the employees, I saw that R&D money wasn't being spent here in Raleigh. And what was being spent as R&D was coming from the company's own revenue. And so there were missing opportunities in the market. And so I approached the owner, the DOD company, the big company in the sky twice, 2010 and 2012, and said, hey, I'd be interested in taking it back private if y'all were interested. And both times they said, nah, we're not ready for that. And so I went on about my retirement. And of course, I think Carol's probably gonna wanna probe and go down that road a bit. So I'm gonna turn it back to you, Carol. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it was, uh, I, I, it's it's amazing. I don't know that I've I know of anyone else that's ever done that to the degree that you have. And um, you know, I, I I'm not sure all of the motivation to require it, but I, certainly it must have been devalued at the time. 
Uh, if you don't mind, talk to us about the process of, uh, of purchasing the assets and, and um, how you went through restructuring it, if you don't mind, Don. No, that's no, no problem at all. In fact, that's been one of the blessings of my life, having an engineering degree and then getting an MBA. I had been recalibrated to understand business right much more. And Raytheon, of course, was such a good parent company, but as big companies go, they see opportunity in other areas. And Homeland Security had such large amounts of grants available over the years that it was lucrative, but then the grants began to dry up. And large companies want to go other places. And so they approached me December 2015 and said, look, we know you had interest before, how about now? And I said, well, okay, maybe, let me do some due diligence, can I talk? And they said, uh, sure. So begin a dialogue of something I didn't think could be pulled off, but as January came, I had formed a company called JPS Investment Holdings, because I knew I had to raise funding. And so uh, that allowed the me to make an offer in a letter of in intent to reacquire the company. And remember, it was operating at that time. And they took accepted that and said, that's a good offer. We accept it, but you have to have the funding to us by this date. Well, I couldn't because I was just in the middle of raising it. And so yeah. what happened, of course, was shut down. And I thought, oh, woe is me. This is bad, but it was good. It was really good because one, I could reduce the price now, I'm not buying an operating business, I'm buying its assets. Two, I got time to raise the funding and I got to raise three pots of money to do this. And three employees got severance. So that means if I pull it off, they're waiting. And so, Went along negotiating and we we reached a deal in April the 15th. We were able to open of 2016 with the reacquired assets. I signed an agreement to lease the building. I had to raise the funding, of course, to acquire the assets. That was the one pot of money. I had to also raise the amount of money in another pot to put the things into the business that it didn't have anymore, like an accounting system, right. like a payroll system, like a benefit system, like computers. And so I had to, of course, raise funding as well to bridge the turnaround, that is R&D funding. And the way I went about that was I formed a list of about 100 people and decided they were going to be my investors, I'd approach them. But uh, I didn't get very far because uh, I only I had to ask about 11 people. And so I had enough money. And so with 12 of us, we then had the funds in JPS Investment Holdings to buy the assets. And I had to quick form JPS Interoperability Solutions Incorporated, C Corp, that's owned by JPS Investment Holdings to start the operation. It, the whole transaction was designed to keep serving the market because the market we serve has a good moral need. And what it does helps the people of this country and other countries. And so it, it was one of those things that it was unlikely, but it happened. And it happened probably because it was meant to. Yeah, uh, it, and, it, and it did happen. And it's been very successful since. But it was almost like starting a new company, wasn't it? You had to find new employees. Uh, I assume you did. And and uh, kind of get everything ramped up from the very beginning, right? Or no? Yeah, it was like starting a new business, but it wasn't. 
when we started in 88, of course, we had to build employee by employee, and the rule of thumb then was we had to need two before we hired one. Right. And we grew a banking relationship, and, and we grew supplier relationships. And when this went along at a slow pace, now suddenly we're standing up a company that doesn't have a banking relationship, for example. But the good news is I had estimated how many employees I would need based on what I raised. And that then allowed me to acquire the employees that were still here to fill the gaps that I thought I needed in the company. And so right. um, I could cherry pick, if that's what you want to call it. And I got the best I could, 20 of them. And <laughs> you know. Yeah, so, so you named the new company J JPS Interoperability Solutions. Why not JPS Communications? Because they still had a subsidiary called JPS Communications that had a contract in California. And that... I, I couldn't get the name, even though the, the assets included the web address www.jps and www.jps communications. Uh, I couldn't use the name, so we had to come up with something else and yet keep the connection to the market that we knew was there. And so it became JPS Interoperability Solutions. And people don't talk about the long name anyhow jps is i guess the more common nickname and so it worked it does so after after this again starting almost from from scratch did, did it did it cost large sums of money just to start with r d with on on new products well yeah it did and and I made a lot of mistakes in this process. And one of the mistakes, you remember, I talked about the three pots of money, one to buy the assets, and of course, one to buy what wasn't in the building anymore, and the third to do the R&D and the turnaround. And I underestimated that. But, but when I looked around here, there was a number of products either in conception that the employees had come up with or at first article. And so I, I said, well, we've got to finish these developments because these people in Raleigh were clearly right about where they needed to take the company. But I didn't have enough funding to really bridge it like I had calculated. And came on me, I design product. I know things take longer, but I still underestimated. So I had to have a second round yeah. of raising capital to bridge the R&D. And that's fine because I didn't have to go outside of the original 12 investors to do that. And so, yeah, it took a pile of money. And if you look at Iron Gate, for example, that we've just released, that's a new product and new market, cybersecurity. A lot of money went into that development, but you got to take risk and you can't stay where you were. Yeah, so in addition to, to the Iron Gate product, what other types or what other specific products have you, has JPS Interoperability Solutions uh, um, developed in the last four and a half years since uh, since the new company began? Well, the, the Z product line, was underway when we acquired the assets, though it had a long way to go in development. You take the ACU 2000, the ACU 5000, the ACU T, a lot of parts approaching obsolescence. And besides, so many features had been added because the market needed them that they were out of processor capacity. And so the ACU Z1 was under development. It's a two-year high rack mount unit with piles of horsepower, quad-core processors that did many, many things that the ACU, original ACU families couldn't do. So we had to complete that development to give us a growth path 
in the traditional gateway market. But the Z2 was really driven by what had happened in the world. You could call it, you've, you've heard of the internet of things. Well, how about the internet of radios? Radios are now distributed over networks. And how are you gonna handle that? Well, you gotta have something out there that bridges radios to networks. So the Z2 is kind of like a DSP-1 in an ACU, several of them, and maybe a PSTN-1 out there hanging on the network. And then we have something called a Z2 controller, which is new, that acts like the CPM on a distributed network-driven gateway. And the Z1 and the Z2 are really getting traction, the Z2 especially, and the Z2 controller. Now, we also knew that the world of radio to SATCOM to radio to telephone to cellular had grown and grown those needs, but we had to get into PTT over cellular. That is the ability with cell phones to key radios that are gated to you. And so VIA came to be. We were driven hard by the market who were saying, look, we can't lease lines anymore for our receiver comparator circuits. You got to be able to do voting over networks. And so we came out with a really elegant way to keep receivers, remote receivers, aligned back at a receiver comparator voter in spite of delays in the network, in spite of packets arriving out of order. And of course, cybersecurity and iron gate, as you, as you mentioned. Now, there are a lot of other things in the technology roadmap that I don't want to go into today. Sure. We'll sure. say this to those listeners. The thing I want to hear is, what do you need? What do you want? And maybe I've got the technology here to do it with a short turnaround. So you, you've got... You've got the company up and running. You through R and D developed all these new products. What was your what was the process that, that you and JPS went through to develop a new sales channel to sell these products? We went back to what worked, though it had holes in it. You heard me talk about the rep network. Well, it, we had one, but it was partial. The same with the international reps. We had dealers, but not as many. We had some distributors, but those needed attention. And so we really had to take what was here in the sales channel infrastructure because I didn't hire, really didn't have opportunity to hire any more people in the sales channel with the exception of Lee Martin. Of course, I, I was able to get Ed O'Connor on board to handle the voter channel. And I had a Far Eastern rep named Colin Ho who handles the sales out there. I, I, I took what I had and we've been building on it ever since with uh, the help of Carol. Who I, had to, I had to convince him to come on board that this was a good risk for him and, and manage this because I'm going to say this right now. I might be the S and JPS, but there's a heck of a lot I can't do in business. And you got to have people that are smarter than you are to do those things if you're going to succeed. And so Carol's been helping us build this system, this network, while people like Iggy and many of the others, Roman Kaluta, are out there interacting with customers all the time. We want to be everywhere we can. With code, of course, we're having to do that virtually, but still it works. You know, Don, it, there must have been something that was specific between the original business plan of JPS Communications and the business plan of JPS Interoperability Solutions. What was, what was the one or perhaps even two things that, that set those two business plans apart in your mind? The, the two business plans, the, the 
The first generation of JPS, that business plan evolved as the markets expanded as we started out with HF radio and then were pulled into the federal market and the military market and the amateur radio market and the LMR market and the public safety market. So the business plan evolved. It's a living document, as you know, in a business, and we had to keep updating it. And so a big difference between that and the second generation of JPS was that those markets already existed. There weren't that many new markets for us to go into with existing product lines. We just had to build out the ability to reach the customer in the sales distribution channel. The other thing that was really significantly different was the complexity of the technology. As time had passed, we started out developing boxes in the first generation that we can turn out three or four a year. Now, with complexity, you've got products that take three or four years to develop and millions of dollars in R&D. That's okay, though. I take that rather than start from scratch again. I don't really have the energy to start from scratch again, but I do have the energy to take what was there and to build it and use people like Todd Dixon to run it day to day as the president of the company and let me think about the vision. And so those are the two things I would say, Carol. That's interesting. I, I, that's, that's good to know. I think that's, that's, that's good information for anyone that's uh, in the need to, to develop a new business plan today. And, you know, over the past 20, 25 years, there have been many changes in how a company and its employees work together to achieve mutual success. It's, uh, it's much different, it's, and it's changed a lot. It's changing right now, today, uh, this year. It has really changed. So what is the culture like at, culture like at JPS today? Culture speaks of the values of individuals and the company and its structure from the very beginning with Tom and Peter and I was built on wanting to do good for people. Now, obviously, you need the numbers to survive because revenue pays the bills, but the way we structured things was we want to do the right thing for the customer, the supplier, the employees. And if we do the right thing, then a certain amount of success will follow. So with JPS, the values now internally are, let, let the people run. And I've told them this many times, This you have the opportunity here to do something very few people have done in a, a capitalist economy. This is the greatest experience. And, and I want you to make mistakes, which is kind of a weird thing to say for leadership. <laughs> if they're making mistakes, they're going forward and they're learning. And so there's no retribution. You, uh, you, you need to be self-motivated, self-starting. You need to do good because your life needs purpose. And this place will give you purpose because this is your second family. And so when we look for people to come in here, we look for people who have similar value systems and they fit in because we're family and what does family do? Well, family has fun together. And so not only are we supposed to do good, we're supposed to have some fun doing good. Yeah. You know, you, you had mentioned the uh, the new product, Iron Gate, that was recently released. And uh, of course, cybersecurity is a concern for everyone needing to protect their, pr protect their systems from being attacked. And would you consider venturing outside of your traditional markets and technologies into, into more of cybersecurity than what you already have done? Absolutely, absolutely. Carol, what I've discovered over the years in this gift called JPS, it's been the rod of a lifetime, is that not only does the market tell you what it wants, 
But once you put something in the market to satisfy that need, the market then says, well, if you can do this, why can't you do that in the same domain? And so a product called Iron Gate will lead to other products. And I can tell you right now, without saying anything, violating any security issues, is that Iron Gate already has uncovered other needs which I fully expect to be required. At least some portion of those needs are always required. You have to be careful though that you don't do every one because you have to do kind of a use case and decide, well, what's the biggest volume? Because you're always gonna have a limited number of engineering resources. So you gotta do the ones that fit the biggest need. But the process of doing one product in a new space leads to others almost by definition and we're going to go into other areas the same way that we're always going to stay in the world of solving communications problem if you think about it it's not just voice it's voice data and video so it's it's obvious we're going to take some more risk and spend some more r d money Absolutely. One last, one last question, Don, if you don't mind. Who will help JPS define its future technology roadmap to, to determine that this con, this success continues on? And, and as you have gone from the ACU 1000 to the SNB 12 voter, and then, then over to the Iron Gate, who's going to help JPS define its future with this technology going forward? This, this company has done another atypical thing over its history. You remember when we started out, part of the catalyst was a new processor called a DSP, a digital signal processor. That means that not only were we market driven, we were technology driven. What was coming out that we could use to solve problems. That continued there was a point after the ACU 1000 and the SNB 12 where we were looking at what should we do next? And the engineers once again said, well, you know what? Everything seems to be IP based, that everything seems to go over a network. I wonder if we could do radio over IP. And so we, we rolled the dice, we said, yeah, we think we can do it. And we came out with the first ROIP, I believe, in our industry. And so that's what I'm talking to, not only the market about what's gonna be the emerging needs, but I'm talking to the engineers because they also have a business sense what technologies are coming out that we can take advantage of to solve problems in the communications world as we go down the road? And, and some of that has to do with, oh, well, you know, we have this technology emerging. What if we married that and attach it to the back of a camera, for example? Uh, that's just, just one example, but it, it's a combination of market-driven. It's a combination of me just doing what's, a great requirement, and that is looking around to see what might be the next need, and then listening to the engineers tell us about what technology, what processors are coming out that we could use. Does that help, Carol? It does. It does. It. it yeah. Hey, that. That's. That's. Uh, that's very. That's. That's very compelling. That. That. That you have that roadmap, and and it's worked so successfully for you and for JPS since its founding uh, in developing new products. Uh, there's, uh, that, that is not always the case with a lot, with many other companies. Carol, I will say yes. we had the opportunity to buy the building back too several years ago, and that's given us the stability to know that we'll be here in the same facility long-term. When we built the building, we put it on four acres, and the building was also designed to be expandable. So as growth occurs, we're going to stay on this same piece of land here in the Raleigh area. 
And if you've ever been to see us, please y'all come back and see us again because you know where we live. Yeah, that's uh, that's, a, that's that's an important comment. Uh, we do we do have uh, a beautiful facility there in Raleigh, and and uh, we hope that everyone will have an opportunity to come there at, at some point in time, and uh, yeah, hopefully in the very near future, as soon as this uh, virus uh, lets up or goes away, then uh, then JPS will will get back to having the on-site training that uh, that's been taking place there for many years, and uh, we uh, we look forward to that. Don, I want to thank you very much. We truly appreciate your sharing the history and evolution of JPS Communications to the new JPS Interoperability Solutions. It's never easy to start a company from the ground up, then guide it to the pinnacle of success. You did this, then picked it up from the ashes that was left behind by the other company that you sold it to, put it back on track, and now JPS is moving forward with incredible success. You are indeed a special individual with special business talents. I want to especially thank each of you who have joined us today. I want to uh, to tell you how how important you are to us as part of our partners that uh, that we have at JPS Interoperability Solutions. We're very appreciative of your being with us. Many of, of you have been a large part of the success of JPS over the years as valued customers, dealers, reps, and partners. We thank you. I also want to thank Iggy Bragado for planning, managing all of the technical aspects of today's event. We couldn't have done it without Iggy. Uh, he's a genius at this. And also thank you all for tuning in, allowing me to ramble on one of the best aspects of founding a business and growing it is all the experiences you have, some of which are extremely humorous, and probably not for publication, but at any rate, they make the belonging as a group richer because of the stories you can tell. I never imagined I'd be here at this age, but I'll tell you what, going back into this operation, I got a whole lot more efficient at managing my time. When I was retired, I'd get up in the morning while I was drinking my coffee, I'd say, what shall I do today? Now, this place doesn't allow me that luxury. <laughs> we do appreciate appreciate each of you. We, we truly do, and we mean that, being with us today. So we'll, uh, we'll let, you, uh, let you go, and, and you have our email addresses and our phone numbers, and feel, please be, feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Uh, regarding this webcast or any of the other webcasts that we've done. Thank you again, Don. This has been a real pleasure and I really mean that. Thank you. <laughs> my pleasure too indeed. And y'all can call my old phone number because it still works. <laughs> okay. Take care everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.